Radiometric dating. Radiometric dating is a, a general term for a number of methods of finding the age of objects by measuring various isotopes in the objects, especially radio isotopes. And if some of these words are strange, you don't have to go over them first and uh, show you what this is useful for. Uh, radiometric dating <coughs> is useful in multiple disciplines. It's used in archaeology, for people who want to know how old some archaeological artifact is, it's used in geology extensively. Geologists want to know the ages of rocks. Uh, it's used in my discipline, it's astronomy, uh, to find the ages of various things. Um, it's really it's become useful for us when we When we first talk about the terms, and then this will introduce what I'm talking about. So, the term isotope. So, once we know what an element is, um, any atom that has eight protons in its nucleus is, is an atom of what element? You get chemists here? Anybody in the chemistry course? I know you know what I mean. Any atom that has eight protons in its nucleus is an atom of what element? Eight, eight, eight protons in the nucleus makes it what element? Uh, yeah. Somebody says uh, oxygen. There's oxygen. Six protons makes it carbon. Right? Seven makes nitrogen. Ninety-two makes uranium. That's what makes an element an element. For protons in the nucleus of the atoms. Nuclei can also contain neutrons, right? Which doesn't really affect the chemical properties. It doesn't affect how the atom interacts with other atoms. This is a chart to keep the isotopes of the atoms straight. The vertical position, number of protons, horizontal position, number of neutrons. So for example, oxygen 16 has eight protons, eight neutrons. Most of the oxygen, something like 65% of your mass is oxygen because you're mostly water. And most of that is oxygen 16, eight protons, eight neutrons. But a small fraction are oxygen 17, eight protons, and nine neutrons. And a small fraction are oxygen 18, eight and 10. So these are all stable isotopes of the first 14 elements. Um, but stable, I mean, nobody's ever seen one of these nuclei spontaneously change into another isotope. And so they're all stable isotopes. So there's a couple of stable isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, and so forth. But there's also radio isotopes. These are all radio isotopes, unstable isotopes, or probably a better word is meta-stable isotopes. So one of these can exist for a while, but then eventually undergoes radioactive decay, which means turning into a different isotope. So for example, oxygen 22 has eight protons and 14 neutrons. It is a radioisotope, but eventually decays into fluorine 22 by beta minus decay. That means the neutron switches into a proton. So it moves, to, it turns into a different element, different isotope. That's called beta minus decay. Neutrons switch it into a proton. Uh, fluorine 22 is also a radioisotope. It eventually turns into neon 22, which is stable. So most of these radioisotopes don't exist on Earth because of they're unstable, and they eventually turn into stable isotopes. So even though you know, the Earth is pretty ancient, so uh, if these were here to begin with, most of them are not here now. Some of them are here now, though, for various reasons, which I'll talk about. So that's what the radio isotopes are Here's the whole chart of the isotopes. So the, the black ones are stable isotopes. Remember, there's like 92 elements, including uranium at the top. The heaviest stable isotope is actually bismuth. And I just put bismuth. All of these are unstable uranium, so this one. The colors mean 
with decaying motors. So these, these decay by beta minus decay neutron switching into a proton. These beta plus decay proton switches into a neutron. The yellow is by alpha decay, which is chucked out an alpha particle, which is two protons, two neutrons. And you can see a couple other colors. So there are a number of ways that a radioisotope can, can decay. <laughs> Okay, I also want to talk about probability because this has to do with the way this stuff occurs. Uh, you know how these work. When you roll a die, it has a one in six chance of rolling a one, right? If it's a fair die. So if you roll a bunch of dice, this is about 1,100 dice, about a sixth of these are going to be one, right? Each one has a one in six chance of rolling a one. So if you roll a bunch of them, about one sixth of them are going to be ones. I haven't counted the number of ones here, but if you want to do that, I can send you this picture. But I, I have, I'm pretty certain that about one sixth of these are ones, and the rest are the other numbers. So you can do an experiment where you roll a bunch of dice, remove the ones, roll what's left, remove the ones out of them, roll what's left, remove the ones out of them. And the number of dice should decrease by a factor of about five six every time, right? Because one six of them are being removed. So if you roll, you're going to reduce the number by a factor of about five six. And here's a here's a simulated experiment where I programmed an Excel file to to roll a million dice. What it did was it chose a million random integers one to six. One or two or three or four or five or six. And then it counted up the ones that it chose and subtracted them from a million. So here's the first rule. It wound up with this many, which is pretty close to five sixths of a million. And then it chose that many random integers, one to six, and counted up the ones that it chose and subtracted from that and got this many. And that's pretty close to five sixths of that. And did this 15 times. And this graph the number left after each roll, and you get this uh, characteristic kind of reduction. It's called exponential reduction because this fits an exponential function quite well. And um, and after 15 rolls, at this many dice, and you would expect the number of dice to be left that's left to be close to a million times five six to the 15th power. Do you see why? Because the first roll, you're multiplying that number by five six, and then you're multiplying what's left by five six, five six by six, fifteen times. So a million times five six to the fifteenth power should be pretty close to that. And you can see that it is. It's, that number is pretty close to the number that this simulation actually wound up with. It's within like seventy of that number. So even though this is millions of randomly chosen integers, um, it leads to some very non-random kind of behavior. And this exponential reduction is characteristic of certain things in nature. Like, for example, the concentration of a blood, of a drug, in the bloodstream over time. So what's plotted here is the concentration of some drug uh, in, against time. If you take, like, an aspirin or something, it quickly goes into your bloodstream through your digestive system. And then it starts to exponentially reduce because there's various processes that remove that from your bloodstream, like filtering out in the kidneys. Uh, the liver does this, and it can also, I guess, be um, oxidized or metabolized in the bloodstream. But various processes reduce it, and they're they're randomly based. Like, for example, when a when an aspirin molecule goes through your heart, every time it goes through your heart, there's a certain chance of going toward the kidneys where it can be filtered out. Right, so it's like rolling the dice. And so you get this exponential type of reduction. And you can talk about the half-life, the, the amount of time that it takes for half of it to go away. And with this, it's about four hours or, yeah, four hours or so. It reduces by a factor of, of two over four hours, and then another factor of two over another four hours, and then another factor of two over another four hours. So this idea of half-life is, uh, is the way they quantify and speed what you can do it. So now radioisotopes reduce their quantity in this exponential kind of way. So for instance, polonium-210 is a radioisotope that has a half-life of 138.376 days. 
So every 938 and 336 reduces its quantity by a factor of two. So this. So here, this is 138.376 days, so then it's 50%. After another 138, so then 25%, and so forth. So, so already you have to have this characteristic uh, exponential reduction, and and each radioisotope has its own half life. So, for example, here this is just a smattering. <laughs> hundreds of these radioisotopes, they all have different outlets. And I chose some extreme examples here. <laughs> Hydrogen 7 is very unstable. It's a super short half-life. It's incredibly tiny fraction of a second. So that doesn't hang around for very long at all. The other end of the spectrum, tellurium 128, this half-life is 160 trillion times the present age of the universe. So, so that's a really long half-life. But all the, I, these are the most extreme examples I could find. Um, all the rest of the video sets of half life in between. Uh, two of these are used in radiometric dating. Carbon-14, you may have heard of that before, has a half life of 5730 years. So whatever quantity is there divides itself in half every 5730 years. Rubidium-87, much longer half life, almost 10 million times longer than this. So this is used for a very different kind of dating thickness, for dating rocks. Um, let me first talk about carbon-14. Um, this, that half-life is way, way shorter than the present age of the Earth. So it wouldn't exist here at all if it weren't for the fact that it's being actively produced on Earth, and it's being actively produced in Earth's atmosphere. There are these high-speed particles come out of deep space called cosmic rays, and they slam into the Earth's atmosphere and cause a shower of particles, some of which are neutrons. These neutrons can be absorbed by stabilized so turning them into carbon-14. And I guess this is the most common of these three methods. But um, but this this is how carbon-14 is produced in the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, it's also going away. Carbon-14 decays naturally into nitrogen-14 with a half-life of 5,730 years. So this, the rate of this is just determined by its half-life. The rate of the production is determined by the flux of cosmic rays impacting the Earth. Right, impacting the atmosphere. Now, the flux of cosmic rays stays relatively the same, not quite the same, and I'll talk about that. But they're being produced and they're going away, so the, the, the level of C14 in the atmosphere stays roughly constant. About one in a trillion carbon atoms in the atmosphere is carbon-14. Um, now, we get most of our carbon from the atmosphere. About a fifth of your mass is carbon. And that comes mostly from the atmosphere because we eat plants and we eat animals that eat plants. And plants fix the carbon from carbon dioxide that comes from the atmosphere, right? So that this carbon comes from the atmosphere. And so one out of every trillion carbon atoms in my body is carbon-14. So I have this radioisotope of carbon. It's always been in the Earth's atmosphere, so you know it doesn't hurt living things. Uh, but when I die, I'm going to stop eating, and and then that carbon-14 will begin to decay in the nitrogen-14. So if somebody digs up what's left of my corpse in 5,730 years, um, the carbon in there won't be one in a trillion carbon-14. It'll be one in two trillion. So you see, because half the carbon atom, uh, carbon-14 will have gone away. Now, my corpse will have decayed, and a lot of the carbon will have going away, but that doesn't affect the, the fraction that's carbon-14 strongly. That's only determined by the rate at which the carbon-14 decays. So so the, the fraction of the carbon that's in a formerly living thing, the fraction of the carbon that's carbon-14 can be used to determine how long it's been dead. And that's how carbon-14 dating works. And it's, it's become extremely useful in archaeology you know, if they find a piece of uh, paper or charcoal that somebody had a fire 40,000 years ago, they want to know how long it's been, they can test the charcoal for carbon-14 level and find out when it's cut down, when that, um, that piece of wood stops taking carbon from the atmosphere. Right? Uh, let me just mention a few... Yeah. May I ask something? Uh -huh. 
Well, not dinosaurs, because they've been gone for tens of millions of years. And carbon-14, its half-life is short enough, it's pretty much gone after a few hundreds of thousands of years. What would they look for dinosaurs? Yeah. Dinosaurs are, you know, mostly fossilized, right? They're rock. And I'll talk about methods of finding the age of the rocks. That's, um, that's a little bit different. This is for things that have been dead a few tens of thousands of years, like, you know, bones of uh, Neanderthal or old pieces of wood. Let me show you examples of things for which this has become very useful. Uh, there's a, a place on the shore of Lake Michigan called the uh, Two Creeks Buried Forest. They're buried trees that were buried up just after the end of the last ice age. And this is how it was first determined when the last ice age ended. I guess there are other things that have determined it now, but back when carbon-14 dating got started, this was one of its first big discoveries. It uh, was able to pin down the time when the, when the previous ice age ended. Um, another probably more famous thing is the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are ancient texts of some Old Testament books or parts of Old Testament books and they were discovered in 1945 they didn't know how old they were. They didn't know, you know, if they were older than the presently oldest uh, copies of those things that they had. And carbon-14 dated, dating has determined that they, they were written sometime in the in the second or first century BC. So they're older than I think any other text we have of those documents. Um, but there's, there's many other uh, uses of carbon-14 data. Okay. Now, uh, the level of C14 in the atmosphere, I said, is about one in a trillion. But it does vary because the flux of the cosmic rays that produce them changes over time because of changes in the sun's activity. Um, and so 50,000 years ago, the level of C14 might have been a little less than it is now. That's going to throw off your your dating estimate if you're assuming that the level is as old than what it is now. So that you have to calibrate for that. The way they do, one of the ways they do that is using tree rings. Uh, you know that when you cut down a tree, you see these growth rings. Uh, every year, a tree grows, you make one more growth ring going out, right? Each of these represents a year of growth. So this thick one, was the year when there's lots of rain, lots of growth, and then thin one here, not so much rain, not so much growth. But you get this characteristic pattern. And all trees that grow in the same region have the same characteristic pattern. Now, if you cut down a new tree, the outer ring is going to be last year's growth. So you know what year that is, and you can count your way back through the rings to find out uh, what years each of the previous rings is representing. And and then if you find, so here's a newly cut down tree that's back here in the mid 50s, so newly cut down in 1950. But, but um, you know, if you, if you just cut down a tree, you can count your way back. But then if you find an older piece of wood, like an old house or something, you may not know when it was cut down, but you can match up the tree rings since they grew in the same region. You see the pattern of, of rings is the thing. So now you can jump over from here, and now you know the date of that ring, and you can walk your way back, find an even older piece of wood. People have walked their way back in time, 14,000 years this way. In other words, they have wood samples going back that long with known ages of the rings. That means you have samples of wood where you know the age, independent of any dating method of walking through the rings. Um, and so you have a carbon sample from that year, and you know exactly what the C14 level is going to be because you can measure it. In time. You see that how that's used to calibrate this. And um, here's the intercal calibration curve. So this line, so this is what the, the known age of something, and this is the, the age that you would measure from an object if assuming that the level of C14 in the past is the same as it is now. The line would be this line if it actually had been the same. But this is this is the, the measured one from the from the tree rings. 
Now, I said they've gone back 14,000 years. This graph actually goes back 50,000 years. So, how do they do most of this graph? Well, most of the calibration of the carbon-14 comes from, from uh, coral with known ages. Coral also incorporates carbon. And there's ways of finding the age of a coral with another radiometric method that I'll talk about in a little bit. So they use tree rings for the relatively young and then for the older set of coral. Um, so that's what we have calibration. Now, one interesting thing about carbon-14, in the 1950s and 1960s, all of a sudden the atmospheric con concentration of carbon-14 jumped by a factor of almost two. Anybody know why that happened? I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. Carbon-14 formation is a nuclear process. Bombs, right? The U.S. and the Soviet Union were exploding these tests, you know, during the Cold War. They were building these humongous nuclear weapons and testing them by exploding them in the atmosphere. And, uh, and those things produce a lot of radioactive systems, including carbon-14. Um, and then the partial test ban treaty was signed in 1963. And then the level of C-14 began to go back down again. Now, you can see it looks like it's decreasing exponentially, but with a half-life that's much shorter than the half-life of carbon-14, right? The half-life is more like a dozen years or so. so. Why is it dropping faster than you would think it would if the carbon-14 were just decaying away? Anybody have any idea? Most of the carbon dioxide in the biosphere is actually in the ocean. It's not in the atmosphere. And carbon carbon dioxide transports freely back and forth from the atmosphere. So the stuff has dissolved into the ocean. And now that's where it is. So the, the total C14 level in the biosphere is, was increased by a few percent with all this nuclear testing. So, but anyway, it's back down to about where it was in the atmosphere before the nuclear testing began. Okay. Now, what about rocks? So much for carbon-14. So that's... Carbon-14 is useful for finding the age of a formerly living thing if it died in the last 50,000 years or so. After that, the carbon-14 is pretty much too, uh, too low in quantity to measure. And uh, so that's what that's limited to. But it's great for archaeology because it's the era that they study. Geologists want to know the ages of much older things. This is a piece of granite. Most rocks are a lot older than a couple of tens of thousands of years. Um, they can be billions of years old. And the first method I want to talk about involves the radioisotope rubidium-87. And it depends critically on the fact that within a rock, <coughs> within a rock, different parts of the rock are chemically distinct from each other. So this is granite, uh, it's an igneous rock. And the reason it's speckled is because there's different minerals in there that are chemically different from each other, in other words different relative amounts of various elements. And, um, and this, this method I want to talk about is, is dependent on the fact that they, that they are distinct. So let me just walk you through how it works so you can see why it works. So okay, what you do is you take a bunch of samples from within a rock, I guess five, and you measure three different isotopes, rubidium-87, strontium-87, strontium-86. Now, this is a radioisotope with a really long half-life, 49 billion years. That's 10 times longer than the age of the solar system. Um, the reason it exists on Earth is because half-life is much longer than the present age of the solar system, so not much of it has gone away. It decays by beta decay into strontium-87, which switches into a proton. And this is stable. Strontium-86 is also stable, but it doesn't have a radiometric source. So in all of these samples, over time, this is going to stay the same. That's going to increase, and this is going to decrease. Okay? You can actually use these 15 numbers to find how old this rock is by, first of all, taking a couple of ratios. You take, in each sample, you take the ratio of rubidium 87 to strontium 86, so this is divided by this, and also strontium 87 to strontium 86, this is divided by this. So as the rock ages, this ratio is going to decrease. This ratio is going to increase by the same amount. 
by a scale of mouse. Now, let me ask you something. If you did this to a brand new rock, say to go to Hawaii and find a piece of basalt that just cooled from, uh, from one of those volcanoes out there, what would you expect to be true about the strontium-87 and strontium-86 ratios for all the samples? Anybody? I think I heard the answer. If strontium-87 and strontium-86 are chemically the same, in other words, the way they interact with other atoms is the same, nearly the same. And so you would expect it to be in the molten lava that formed this, you would expect it to be mixed the same way in there. So you expect all these ratios to be one? Uh, no, not one, but the same as each other. Right? Like if I had a glass of water and I put a, a drop of red dye and a drop of blue dye, I wouldn't, after mixing it up, I wouldn't expect one part to be bluer and another part to be redder, right? I'd expect that the same color of purple everywhere. And because the way they interact with other molecules is the same. So these ratios you'd expect to be the same. But these ratios, no, because they're different elements, different parts of the rock are chemically different. So they have different relative amounts of the different elements, right? So you can see this, these are not the same, so this is not a brand new rock, okay? Let me just show you how they change by graphing, graphing these pairs of points on a graph where that x-axis, y-axis, x-axis, y-axis. So this is a brand new, now this is not the same number. Is different. It's a brand new rock. So each one of these is a sample. The horizontal position, the rubidium 87 to strontium 86 ratio, and the vertical sample, you have the strontium ratio. They're all the same, all at the same level this way. Right? Now what happens when this begins to age? All of these ratios are going to go down, and the strontium ratio is going to go up. Right? This is 10 billion years later. You know, it's older than the solar system, so there are no rocks that look like this. It's just for illustration. This one has gone down the most and up the most. This one has gone down the second most, you see, because that started out with the most rubidium. So it's gone the furthest. And that's 10 million years, so 20, 30, 40, 50 giga years. All the points have gone about halfway to the vertical axis because that's one, about one half life later and the same amount up and they still are in this nicely arranged straight line and the slope of that line is directly related to the age. So it's um, as it's simple as that, the slope is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the slope and the amount of time that that rock's going to sell it up. Now you might think, well, billions of years, that's an enormous amount of time. What if various life stones are leached in and out of the rock over that time? That can happen, and it does happen with most rocks. But then the points won't be in a straight line. And there's no plausible reason why they should be in a straight line, except that it really is that old. So this is called isochron dating. And let me show you some applications of this. This, this is some isochrons from a moon rock brought back by one of the Apollo astronauts during the Apollo missions, I'm going to strap myself to get a moon rock here. And, um, and this is the basalt from the moon. The moon's volcanic activity happened long ago. You know, Earth is still volcanically active, so there's brand new basalt that there's none on the moon. And you can see that the, the age, the slope corresponds to an age of 3.57 giga years, 3.57 billion years. So they did two methods with the same rock. This is rubidium strontium. This is samarium neodymium. Samarium decays into neodymium. Samarium 147 decays into neodymium 144. By alpha decay with a half life of 160 the years. And a different slope, but corresponding to the same age, the same rock. Um, and here's you know, a bunch of ages from these moon rocks. So each square represents a rock. And you can see an age. And you can see the samples brought back by Apollo 17, they landed in different places for different missions. They're systematically older than from Apollo 15, just systematically older than from Apollo 12. That's because the, the volcanic 
activity at these various places occurred at different times. And there's none that are younger than three giga years because by then the moon has ceased its volcanic activity. So if they use those methods, so if they use those methods to find out if there's pipe on the um, I don't know about reading metric methods, but um, I mean, if there's been life in the past. Uh, well, we, we don't have any samples. No, that's not quite true. We brought back samples from Mars. So don't, we can't identify a location of Mars with its age. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I'm sure. If they find microfossils or something from Martian rocks once people are going near, they're going to want to know the age of it. Um, yeah. You can't, you probably can't find out whether or not there's life per se, but you can find the age of the rock that way. Um, one of the reasons this is useful, you know, people wanted to know what's the geologic history of the moon. Uh, so one of the reasons this is very useful to people who study planets is that this is the surface of the moon and these round things are impact craters, right? Each one caused by a meteor impact. And you can see that there's, there's more craters over here than over here. It's not because this was more heavily impacted, but it's because of volcanic activity. This, this uh, basalt has at some point erased the craters over here. So all the craters you see in this region have been formed since that time, since that basalt activity. So if you know the age of that, which you can, if you find that you bring back a piece of basalt, you can find the age like they did, then you can say, okay, all those impacts have occurred since that time, since that long ago. Now you know something about how much impacting has occurred since then. And then you go to a different and you know its age and you have to create the bitter. Okay, that, that much impacting is occurred since then. You can characterize the rate of impacting on the way history of the moon. And this graph represents, so the vertical axis is density of crater is bigger than a one kilometer in diameter as a function of age. So here's brand new. Here's a couple of points that are very low density because they haven't had any time to accumulate craters. And as you go to older and older surfaces, there's more and more craters. Uh, the importance of this is now you have a relationship between crater density and age. So you can go to a picture of Mercury. There was a probe that orbited the planet Mercury for a number of years. We have pictures of the entire surface now. Find the density of craters there, you know the age. So you can, that helps to um, interpret you know, the geologic history of Mercury. It's in a different part of the solar system, so there's differences and probably differences in impact rates, but um, but we have some idea of the history of impact in the solar system. So there's one of the useful things about this. Okay, uh, now we switch isotopes. Let me talk about uranium isotopes. Uranium, element number 92, is the heaviest element we have any amount of on Earth. So, it has two isotopes that exist in large abundance, U238 and 235. They're both radioisotopes. And when they decay, see they have big half-lives, 704 million years, four and a half billion years. When 238 decays, it turns into another radioisotope, thorium-234, which only has a half-life of 24 days. And in fact, when that decays, it turns into another radioisotope, which turns into another radioisotope. And it's decay all the way down until you get the lead, 206, which is stable. So this is called the decay chain of uranium-238, all these radioisotopes in between uranium and the final state of it, which is lead. Same for 235. Uh, there's a chain of decays until you get lead-207, which is stable. Um, now, all of these half-lives are way shorter than the half-life of 238. So on a geologic time scale, once they decay, they effectively suddenly turn into lead. And, uh, and this is used for dating of many rocks. Uh, one kind of crystal that is used to uh, date is zircon. Zircon um, is a crystal mineral which is on Earth. And when it forms, it incorporates uranium into its crystal structure, but not lead. 
And so it starts out with no lead, but lots of uranium. And then over time, the uranium decays into lead. So any lead that exists in there is, you can assume it's radiogenic. So what you do in a zircon crystal, you measure four isotopes, the two lead products, and then the two uranium radiogenic isotopes. And, um, and then you take some ratios like you do to the other, the 206 to uranium 238, which is, that decays into that. And the ratio of lead to a 7 point. And, and it traces out this nice pattern in the graph. So this is after half a billion years at one billion. Right? Um, so one of the advantages of this, there's two different radioisotopes. So there's, uh, you know, verification by two different methods every time you take an edge of this. Uh, there's, with zircon crystals, you can actually tell more. Because they start out with no lead, there's additional things you can tell about, you know, the, the history of the conditions that it's, that, that it's been through in the past. Uh, but that's a little bit much to talk about. I don't have that much time. But um, let me just show you some ages of zircon crystals. So here's a diagram showing the number of zircon crystals found in the human age. So this is for like over 100,000 dating uh, determinations for that many crystals. And this is in mega years. So this is a billion years, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. The age of the solar system is about 4.6. Be used. So you don't get any zircons older than you know a certain age. But then there are these peaks where there was a lot of zircon formation at certain points in the past, like 1.8 billion years ago, there was a lot of zircons. 2.75 or so, a lot of zircons being created then, which means there was extensive geologic activity at these these certain times. Does anybody know what happened at those times? major geologic events. We don't have any geologists in here. Ice age. Ice age. Ice age. Oh, no, actually, it's when these supercontinents form. There's been a, you know, they talk about supercontinents. When the continents come together and group into the ones, right? that's happened numerous times in the history of the Earth. And each one is associated with extensive volcanic activity. And you can see that in, in these data. Um, now, of course, finding the age of a zircon is useful for many things. What geologists want to know when they see a geologic structure and there's all these different things that have occurred in the past, they want to know when each thing occurred. So when they find an igneous intrusion, they want to know, okay, when did that happen? They want a metric date for that. And they can disentangle, you know, the sequence of events that led to that. So, so Okay, now, um, zircons have the advantage of starting out with no lead, but there are lots of rocks that have uranium in them that also start out with lead. And there's ways to find the ages of those as well. Sort of like with the rubidium strontium, where you take many samples in there, and they call it lead lead dating, where you measure three isotopes of lead. Lead 207, lead 206, and lead 204. They're all stable isotopes. 206 forms from uranium-238, 207 from uranium-235, and let 204 doesn't have a radiogenic source. So that's kind of benchmark in here. And if you take a bunch of samples and take these ratios, 204 to 206, 207 to 206, and plot a bunch of samples in a brand new rock, they all plot in one spot, but then that's the same ages. Those, those points move across the graph. And again, the slope of this line is tells you what the age is. So this has turned out to be useful for some of the oldest solid objects that we know about. Um, there are solid, what they call chondrules, by certain meteorites, that their radiometric ages are older than any other radiometric age has ever obtained. And they've been obtained by this method using what the way of dating. Um, kind of a neat age, 4.567 giga years. Those are the oldest radiometric uh, dates of, of any solid objects that we have. So this is, you know, these are, these are things that formed 
just after the beginning of the formation of the solar system. And this is you know, close, very close to the age of the solar system, right? Um, okay. Uh, let me go back to these decayed chains of two uraniums. So these half-lives are longer than a quarter of a million years, right? That's still 18,000 times shorter than the original half-life, but it's kind of long. And it tends to, that's useful for finding the ages of certain things like heliogams, which is a general term for like stalactite, stalagmite. And also corals. Both of these things form from materials that come from dissolved material in water. So speleothems on the stalactite forms the stuff that is dissolved in the water, and then when the water evaporates, it uh, solidifies, we call it, precipitates onto the solid object. And uh, with corals, I guess the little animal in there extracts the stuff from the dissolved material in the water and forms the solid. You know, little house that lives in. So both these things uh, form, form from the dissolved in water. Now it turns out that uranium is soluble but not thorium. So they start out with uranium but no thorium. And you can see that in this decay chain, the uranium decays into thorium 230. So that um, when when a coral forms, it has uranium 234. But no thorium 230, and then over time that builds up. And I'll show you a graph of how it builds up. So here's the, the gray line is the ratio of thorium 230 to uranium 234. It's zero age, it's zero, and then it builds, starts building up over time. This is 50,000 years, 100,000. And it eventually levels off because thorium 230 is also a radioisotope. So as soon as the, the rate that it's forming equals the rate that it's going away, it stops building up and it levels on. But up to maybe half a million years, you can find the ages of these heliothems, galactides, like my or corals, with this method. And this is, I told you earlier, that um, corals are used to calibrate the radiocarbon method. Right? Corals also have carbon in their structures, which comes from the atmosphere. So you find their ages with this radiometric method and, um, and, and also and take carbon samples from that so you can best use to calibrate the radiocarbon method. Um, okay. So uh, then switch radioisotopes again. The Cathy 40 is another long radioisotope. Decays into two things. It can decay into calcium 40 or into argon 40, doing the opposite thing. This is beta, this is beta plus decay, this is beta minus decay. And, and it's long half life, 1.2 GB years. So this stuff has been around since the formation of the Earth. Now, argon, of course, is a gas. And so if there's lava that's going to solidify into rock, the gas is bubbled away. So when it turns into a rock, it starts out with potassium-40, but no argon-40. And then the argon-40 builds up over time. So, so and you, this is the way it builds up over time. You measure the ratio of argon-40, potassium-40, in a rock, and it's related to the age like this. Now, this has been used for, for various purposes, finding the age of rock. One thing that's, that's especially helpful in is finding the ages of sedimentary rocks in the Aldivai Gorge. This is a place in Africa where they find very ancient human remains, like our ancestors from millions of years ago. And, um, and so they've been able to find out when these when these people lived there and it's helped in anthropologists to disentangle you know, our deep past uh, human fossils. Proto-human fossils. Now, I'm going to talk about one more isotope. This isn't really used in a dating method per se, but it's um, uh, iodine 129 decays into xenon 129 with half life of 15.7 mega years, million years. Now, this is too short 
for this stuff to exist on Earth. Earth is a lot older than this. And so none of this exists here. Uh, but if the uh, elevated levels of xenon one to nine are found in certain meteorites, this is a rock called the Robertson meteorite, and in about 1960 years ago, so, it was discovered that it has extra xenon 129. So they, this represents the left relative amounts of the isotopes of xenon in this rock. So there's lots of isotopes of xenon that are stable. Um, but, and you can see they follow this nice orderly arrangement that's thought to be due to uh, fractionation and formation of the rock. But you can see the outlier is xenon 129. And it's thought that this is in there because it started out with some iodine one tonight, which then decayed into xenon one tonight, elevating that level of xenon one tonight. And that means that when the rock formed, it had to have that iodine one tonight. Well, iodine one tonight has a 15.7 million year half life. This is curved for 15.7 million year half life, and you can see that it's down to almost nothing after 100 million years. Now, 100 million years is a long time, but it's, only, it's less than 1% of the age of years. And that means that if uh, if it really is true that this iodine, that this rock started out with iodine 129, the iodine had to have been formed a relatively short time prior to formation of that rock. And then, so, and the only, the only process we know about for sure that makes iodine, or in fact, pretty much any other element in the lower half of the periodic table, is a neutron star merger. This is a cataclysmic cosmic event. Um, neutron stars are the remnants of, <coughs> of heavy stars after they explode. So the idea is, in the star forming region where the sun forms in the solar system, there was lots of star formation. These heavy stars lived their lives, exploded, and some of these neutron stars interacted and merged, and this makes a, an extremely energetic process, which we know produces elements. One of these was observed last August. It was the first time that <clears throat> any cosmic event has been observed in both electromagnetic radiation, light and ultraviolet and X-ray and so forth, and also in gravitational waves, that is, waves through the fabric of space. Um, the gravitational waves confirm that what's different temperature. It's hard to tell. And then the, the other observation is after it was discovered that the gravitational waves was very heavily observed by dozens of very fancy observatories because they wanted to know, do these things really make a lot of elements? Because it had been suspected by astrophysicists for decades that this is responsible for making like the whole bottom half of the periodic table. Let me just show you the periodic table. So hopefully you've all seen periodic table before. This one color coded for astrophysicists think is the type of event that produces those elements. And <laughs> the only hydrogen and helium come from the beginning of the universe. And all the rest are produced in subsequent that, mostly by processes associated with stars, exploding stars and uh, dying stars. And you can see the whole bottom half of the periodic table is primarily from these neutron star mergers, including iodine. And in fact, uranium and thorium is thought to be produced only by the, that kind of process. Now, it could be that there's other environments that are energetic enough to produce these elements, but uh, there's no evidence for that. Uh, so what's interesting is that um, you know these elements may, may very well have been produced in these momentous events, you know, just prior to the formation of the solar system. One of the reasons that's interesting to me, anyway, is that uranium and thorium, <coughs> we have loads of that in the Earth, uh, those are thought to be responsible for, for the heating of the inside of the Earth. And that heat is what is what drives both plate tectonics and also the Earth's magnetic field. And both of those are required for the, the continued habitability of the Earth's surface. So, I mean, life's been on the Earth for over three and a half billion years, right? <clears throat> That's partly because the Earth is a nuclear reactor. 
And um, that wouldn't be the case if the solar system building material hadn't been <coughs> hadn't been enriched in all these heavy elements probably just prior to the formation of the solar system. Uh, so that's uh, so this is just a list of some of the isotopes I talked about. So wide range of half-lives, um, wide range of uses, and I appreciate your attention. Yeah, so, yeah, most, most of the elements on Earth you know, come from these, uh, these cataclysmic events. We, <clears throat> there's direct evidence for their production in, in various these processes. Um, you know, this, that, this event last August was probably the strongest evidence for, for neutron star production. You know, the whole lower half of the periodic table is far less abundant than the upper half. Right? I mean, they're thousands of times less abundant, so they're not as important. So, but, uh, you know, the core of the Earth is iron, and that's the second most abundant element in the Earth. That comes from a certain kind of stellar explosion. But, yeah, that's... You know, the sun, the solar system, one about a third of the age of the universe, so there are loads of time for all kinds of stuff to happen. And we, we're standing on ashes of stellar explosions, and we are. And, and then you were like, if, if there's more than something happens, that might somehow modify the living age of one, like modify some channel? I suppose so. I mean, it's like a, a particular environment where it's too much of one element or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, well, now, if you mean radiation is definitely bad for life. We don't have that much radioactive stuff in our environment. If there was more, it would be lethal to us. That's what you mean. But are you talking about this? Yeah, wait, are you saying that? How far does it go? Yeah. 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 What's interesting to me about this is the you know we don't know exactly what are what are the initial requirements to, to make an Earth you know that eventually gives rise to all the life that we have, but we're learning more about what that is. So it might be possible to tell where in another galaxy it's likely to find good places for life to form. Um, but I think you're right. There, there's probably plenty of places where the wrong combination of events occur. The elements, the initial products are not right for, for just the right thing to occur. Um, I think I answered your question. That's where it's yeah, but it's definitely, you know, if it's too much radiation, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, uh, the, the concept of that has changed a little bit over time. Before I was looking into this, I didn't know about the production of dying moment from stars. Um, yeah, it, when I first started teaching astronomy at GPT, um, the picture was a little bit different. It was a lot more than where. So it, it's a little bit more complicated picture than people use. So now, elements up to iron, up to iron, from hydrogen up to iron, are formed in normal thermonuclear processes in stars. Not the sun, but heavier stars. And, but I guess the present understanding is that the ones that we have on Earth, mostly 
from these cataclysmic events. In other words, not from normal nuclear reactions that occur in stars, but from after that. You know, they explode and then I think that's the present concept that you're understanding. Oh, well, I was thinking of the question I was going to ask. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I know some of the he elements this morning, he's going to be arced, and he's going to be arced. Yeah. That's because neither of those elements has any stable isotopes. So they're probably formed in there, but they don't exist on Earth because there's no stable isotope. This is technetium, that's promethium. That's a good question. Um, they're, they're probably formed, but none exists on Earth, so we can't talk about what fraction of them on Earth are, are generated by chemicals. So they probably should be colored, but we don't know what the colors, the amounts of colors should be because, okay. But what's interesting is technetium is actually observed in the, uh, in the spectra of these kinds of stars. And the longest half-life is like three and a half million years or something, which seems like a long time, but that's much shorter than the lifetimes of these stars. So the only way it could be there is that it's pretty deep produced there. In other words, that's a validation of the fact that these are producing at least that element, you know, and the only the mechanism that's supposed to be responsible is would also produce all these other energy questions. Yeah, yeah, that's just yeah, yeah. these are just two of the elements that don't have any stabilized okay. they don't exist in things. Mm -hmm. Well, the question I was um, wondering about, um, since you said that a lot of the elements, you know, there must have been a neutron um, star merger that seeded our um, forming solar system. Um, are there any objects out there nearby enough that would be candidates as being the result of that merger? Um, well, with this one that was observed last fall, they didn't even know what the outcome was. They didn't know if it was a black hole or another neutron star. Yeah. So presumably they turn into black holes, but those are, are very hard. Yeah, so there would be maybe yeah. black holes. Basically. There could be loads of black holes yeah. around here, but they're, yeah. they're so difficult to detect because they're black holes. And how far, I mean, it's, it's been a pretty, you pretty know, rapid process that's going on when they merge and, you know, the energy that's spread. Um, well, how far do these elements see that as stuff go? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you make these tremendous shockwaves that propagate out through the star forming regions. So, and I guess that contains material. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have to be pretty close, I think, in order to successfully feed this stuff. It probably has to be multiple. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Well, thank you again.